The location I'm at today is a little bit different and it's one that I've not covered before. I've never been to this site before, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, but we're on the trail of these, the ME262. And here at the Shepak Forest in Bavaria, it's just near the town of Augsburg, which if you know your history of Bomber Command and the first operational use of the Lancaster Bomber, will be familiar with that town. Um, but it's here that the ME262 was made in the forest. So let's go and see what remains of the former production site here at Kuno 2. So Germany has always been a country full of inventors and you'd be surprised at some of the things that Germany was responsible for. So things like the car, the telephone, the diesel engine, uh, the electron microscope, coffee filters, uh, as a big favourite of mine, and uh, also took part in the race for the development of the jet engine. And it's here at the site called Kuno 2. It's just on the motorway uh, from Augsburg in Bavaria, um, heading towards Stuttgart. And it's at this site that as the war in Europe turned against the Nazis, that they had to disperse their manufacturing plants thanks to the efforts of the Royal Air Force and the United States Army Air Force's round the clock bombing campaign. It was at dispersed sites like this that the aircraft would be assembled and then flown off the autobahn to their forward units uh, where they would then go into combat in the dying days of the Second World War. So here at Kuno 2, between late 1944 and April 1945, when the US Army finally overran the site um, and finding it deserted because the Germans had already pulled back as the Americans were pushing further south into Bavaria and toward the Austrian border, 
um, only 100 ME262s were built here. Now, to bring that into a little bit of perspective, 1,400 ME262s were produced throughout Germany um, during World War II in total. So a tiny, tiny number. And of those 1,400, only 300 saw combat. There are thereabouts, they're approximate figures, of course. Um, so it gives you an idea of how desperate the Germans were that they had to resort to spreading out their production of their most, or one of their most advanced pieces of weapon, weaponry to a forest location like this. Although you've got to give them credit in some regard because the idea worked and they were able to produce jet fighters in the woods, albeit um, with a considerable human cost attached, sadly. Um, but it's a really interesting site, so we will go and take a proper look and see what we can find here. Now, what's really interesting about this site in particular is that the local council have put together a woodland walk that covers off the remaining um, sort of remnants of the infrastructure that's still in existence here in the forest. And there's like a little information trail so you can uh, navigate your way around. And even if you don't really know too much about it, it's still a nice walk. Um, but it also has a darker side. It's not just about the aircraft and about feats of um, daring pilots in dogfights in the skies over Europe. Clearly, as the Nazi regime became more desperate, they turned to their populations in concentration camps and labour camps to um, take part in the assembly of war weapons. And it's at this site that over 150 inmates from the local labour camps were brought in. They were all men, and their human story is very much part of this place. Behind me, just there, is the foundations, what's left of the production hall that was used for the final assembly of the aircraft before they were then rolled out for a engine test and a gun test and then put onto the autobahn to be taken off and delivered to whichever unit was going to receive it. It's about 150 meters long. There's nothing really left now other than a very uh, straight channel uh, and the foundations. Clearly the, the building would have spanned into where we stood on the path now. Um, So dotted all around the Kuno 2 site here are these wooden ME262 signs and they guide you around the site. And um, here it's pointing to a path and there's a box with some more information. So let's go take a look. It 
So here we find another information board and this one actually tells us what happened here um, at this location. So it's saying that we're here at this top left hand corner and as you can see that's the main production building, final assembly building. We just walked up that path. Um, the aircraft would come in from all these different sub-assembly points into this entrance here then down through it would come out of the building ready for uh, an engine test and gunnery test and then it would be rolled out onto the autobahn fired up and then the pilot would take it to whichever forward unit would uh, would require it at the time and you see there it's got some wartime photos of parts um, so they were taken post-war by the Americans no doubt as it just looks abandoned but left there um, where they were found in 1945 and in the box there's a pretty cool model it's a bit hard to see it with the reflection but there is a 262 in there so when we think of the ME262 I think it's probably natural that most of us think of the technological developments that the aircraft was responsible for so the advent of jet engines, having a swept wing to achieve higher transonic numbers, um, the massive power um, of the, the four 30 mil cannons in the nose, uh, the fact that you could attach rockets under the wings um, and how potentially devastating it would have been had it have been produced in greater numbers earlier in the war. It would have been an absolute game changer and there's no doubt about that. Um, but the darker side to it and the human suffering behind it and like a lot of Germany's uh, wonder weapons there was uh, a far darker um, aspect to them and it's this part of Kuno 2 uh, in front of me here that you can see now um, and while very little remains there is some foundations here just behind this tree uh, this is where the 150 or so men from the local uh, labor camps were brought and where they were accommodated. I won't say where they lived because that would um, assume that they had a quality of life here. They really didn't. Um, if they could stand on their own two feet for long enough, they were forced to work here. Um, their food ration, again, if you can call it that, did double from one slice of bread and uh, I think like, you know, watery soup a day to two slices of bread um, along with the soup. And they were responsible for the assembly of these aircraft. And it's the one side of um, anything connected with these incredible advanced pieces of technology they were you know we can't deny that they had operational jet aircraft um, you know in production and flying operationally before we did um, as the allies but the irony that Hitler and the Nazi party turned to its um, state enemies the Jewish population the um, those in labor camps to construct these highly advanced pieces of equipment. Now, I appreciate a lot of um, the assembly was done at different locations and, and the sub-assemblies were brought here for final assembly before the aircraft was flown away. But still, to have a group of people who you have demonized and ostracized and brutally treated for years to then work on these weapons has always been something that I've never been able to comprehend um, and it's when you come to these places and you see these remains um, that the human side does come forward and we have to remember that there were a lot of unfortunate people caught up in this that were forced to do this work um, and we should you know, respect their memories and, and respect um, what they went through and remember it for future generations and as part of this area of the camp there's another one of these boxes here so let's take a look and see what's in this one so here it's showing the um, area where we're at 
Um, I believe that was a postcard from the 1950s. The area was re uh, repurposed after the war. But here it shows the original plans um, of the concentration camp area. And a chilling reminder if it was needed is the barbed wire here that would have detained the prisoners that were working here. carry on through the site there's these little signs here and again yet another chilling reminder of uh, how the site was secured both to stop people getting in and to keep those forced laborers from getting out and here's just saying about the different camouflage used to keep the site uh, hidden from the air clearly um, this site was of vital importance to the war work that the Germans were doing, even in the, the dying um, months of the Second World War. And they wanted to keep it camouflaged, so they would have covered it with camouflage netting um, and then also small uh, spruce trees, it was saying, laying over the top to just try and hide it from the roving Allied fighter bomber patrols and reconnaissance aircraft patrols that would have been scouring this area almost, almost. Um, unopposed throughout the, the final months of the war. So carrying on through the site down this path, we're walking now through the um, sort of domestic areas. The ramp here and the foundations that you can see, they believe that was part of the, um, like a boiler room I think, to help with some of the heating. And then further down here and to the right and you can sort of see the foundations running through these trees here and you see it better in a second as we come around the corner there's the foundations on the right side of the box here to what was the canteen and then where those logs are on that concrete plinth that was the toilet block. But interestingly, in this box is the story of this lady here. And she was brought to work here. She was 24 years old. She came from Auschwitz and was then moved down to Dachau and then, uh, then brought to here. But we can see there's some remnants of what was used here and in particular this it was a um, like a potato press that was used in the canteen I'm assuming that this is a sort of they've remade this um, but it uh, again is just a chilling reminder of that human cost that went into the production of what was a very impressive wartime aircraft. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, I'll put the link in the description below for the details of this place and there is a small museum in the local area that's dedicated to what took place here at the site. Unfortunately though it's open at some really random times so I haven't been able to visit it but I'll find the details for that and I'll put that in there as well. Okay thanks everybody and I'll see you all in the next one.